Welcome, my friends. You're listening to The Voice of the Eternal Gospel, a program brought to you by the Eternal Gospel Ministry, founded in 1992 by Seventh-day Adventist believers. This is a Christian program dedicated to bring you the prophetic fulfillment, warning, and revelations of the end times, and to promote the advancement of Christ in your life. Welcome, my friends, again to The Voice of the Eternal Gospel. I'm Pastor Rafael Perez, and I'm inviting you to pray with us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to study about this special group, the Bible, the 144,000. Help us, O oh Lord, uh, to, by thy Holy Spirit, for us, each one of us, to remain faithful to you, and that many souls out there can be uh, gained into thy kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, let, let's um, yeah, uh, we co were continue about, with this topic. We were talking about the issue of Elijah, and I want to bring out one thing just to show you that it's John the Baptist is not Elijah, but he comes in the spirit and power of Elijah because of the mm -hmm. fact of what's asked him. In John chapter 1, the Bible says here, and uh, looking at verses um, 19 and 20 and 21, it says here, And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Mm. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? Or we're talking about Elijah? Mm -hmm. And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What mm -hmm. saith thou thyself? And he said, He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Make straight the way of the Lord, said the prophet Isaiah. Mm -hmm. It says here, and I, that, okay, it says, And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. So we, we see over here that John the Baptist understood that the job, that his main work was to prepare the people so when Jesus will come out into the public, they will see on him the Messiah, that he was the, indeed the Messiah. He was the forerunner, right. The, the he, forerunner. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's bring it us for today. Okay. This group of people in Revelation 14, yes. there will be also men and women from all nations, from all background, that will prepare the, the way, so to speak, for the second coming of Christ. That's right. and, that's why the, and that's why I said in the previous program that this will be the third Elijah. Now, if I ask you... Um, now, let's, let's look at some characteristics so you can get this, because you, you're talking about this issue of third Elijah. In order to know who this third Elijah or what this third Elijah really is, we need to look at some characteristics about Elijah. Mm -hmm. First of all, Elijah's name meant Jehovah is my God, mm -hmm. meaning that Elijah's name pointed to pointed everyone to the Creator. Okay, and, and we need to live very clearly. It's not going to refer specifically to one man one only, man, right, or one right, woman. Okay, right. and then, mind if I read Mark nine eleven through thirteen? Go ahead, because it's it talks about John the Baptist in terms of Elijah. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias or Elijah must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the son, and now it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things, and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias or Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. So Jesus uh, identified John the Baptist, John the Baptist as, that Elijah. as Elijah, even though John the Baptist said that he wasn't. No, they, they, oh, you were going to read something else if, because I have a question for now, you. Now, let, now let's look at now. Just go to because that's the same chapter in nine, John, right? Mark, Mark, Mark. Look, for, look at verse four to show you again that when Jesus said Elijah did come, he's not talking about the Elijah that got translated. He's talking about in the form of John the Baptist, because look mm -hmm. here at verse 4, and when it went on the Mount of Transfiguration, look mm -hmm. very carefully. Uh, start verse 1. Verily I send to you, it says, He sent to them, Verily I send to you, that there be some of you standing that stand here, 
we shall not taste what? Death yeah. till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Mm. This is dealing with the second coming. Mm. All right. And after six days, Jesus take of, take of him Peter and James and John and leading them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shiny, exceeding white as snow, and so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared to them what? Unto them what? Who appeared? Elias, Elias, Elias. and Moses. And they were talking with him. Talking with who? With Jesus. Jesus. Now, Elias was translated way back in the Old Testament. Right. Now he's standing with Moses and then with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is the literal Elias sitting right here in verse 4. Hmm. But That's Jesus it. said to the Pharisees over in verse 13, he says, Elias verily cometh first to restore all things. But then in verse 13 he says, but I said to you, Elias is indeed come. Right. Now, who was it that came? Because it's not Elias here. No. The literal Elias, it was John the Baptist right. that yes. he's referring to. Right. And, and Yeah, of course. Mm. And, and Jesus said it and later on. He says, they, you even killed him and did everything that you wanted with him. Right. Because and he was beheaded. Because remember, the, the, the real Elias was translated. Uh, he, he never saw that. But this right. one that came in his spirit and power, Elias, John the Baptist, they cut off his head. And just like Elijah came and then John the Baptist at Christ's first coming... The third Elijah will be the 144,000 and will go through a similar experience, preparing the way for Christ's second coming. Okay, let's look at one more similarity, though. Elias in the, uh, Elijah in the Old Testament was dealing with Jezebel. He dealt with a woman. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist was also in a conflict with a woman. <laughs> the Jewish Okay, the church, Jewish, let's the remember. Leadership. Wait, no, what, what was that no, woman? Remember? No, no, no. Herod had Herod's a party. wife. Remember Herod? John the Baptist. There was a king and there was a woman. What That's was right. John's problem? John rebuked Herod for a lame with his brother's wife. Mm -hmm. And that was a listen fair. Herodias got so upset mm -hmm. that she was figure out how she could stop, shut the mouth of the prophet. Mm -hmm. When her daughter came to the Herod's birthday party, and dance a salacious dance in front of Herod, mm -hmm. very sensual. Mm -hmm. Herod was so drunk with wine, because you know, Proverbs 20 verse 1 said, wine's a mark of strong drink is raging, he deceived thereby is not wise. He was so drunk with the wine, to what did he do? He was so inebriated, he said, ask me whatever ask you me want. Ask me whatever you want. I'll, I'll be, do it for I'll you. I'll give you half my kingdom. <laughs> yeah. And what did she say? She went to her mother. I remember, went to a woman, went to her mother. And the mother said, not, the, not Herodias, Herodias. Uh, 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 he was drunk. I mean, uh, uh, Salome uh. didn't know what to ask. Right. And the mother said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Wow. On a silver what, platter. What a wow. parallel. What a parallel. Herod was drunk with the wine. That's right. He was the king the of the earth. The kings of the earth, the, the Bible says, are going to be drunk. The whole world are going to be drunk with the wine of the modern day Babylon. Revelation 17. That's right. Okay. One and two. That's right. That's right. And the third Elijah are going to be facing the kings of the earth. The going new to be drunk. That, that Jezebel. Which is going to be called spirit. and and the king of the earth. Now is th this modern day Elijah is going to face a Jezebel and her daughters who are going to be called Babylon. Wow. That's what the Bible said. Uh, uh, does history does history repeat? Does history repeating this? Right. Revelation seventeen one and two. Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay. Um, I, I, a question that I have for both of you was, why the second, we know that the message of the second Elijah or John the Baptist mm -hmm. was so important because it, it, it was as, as it was prophesied from Isaiah chapter 40, he was going to prepare the way, okay, right. oh, for the Messiah, for Jesus. Now, why did God have to send this, his voice from the wilderness? 
and not from the temple, not from the synagogue. Why? Well, number one, one reason why John the Baptist was raised in the wilderness is because the educational system that had taken place in the Jewish economy at that time had been compromised. It had been uh, very, it was uh, actually, it was, uh, it was Hellenized mm -hmm. by the Greeks. Mm -hmm. Remember, between the book of Malachi and the book and the New Testament, there's 400 years of silence because the Jews had made a league with Alexander the Great. Right. You remember, the story goes that when, Eli when the Jews got ready to, when Alexander got ready to attack Jerusalem, he had sent letters to the Jewish leaders that they would join him against the per Medo-Persian armies. Mm. But the Jews sent back a reply saying that we will not join with you because we owe the Persians with, to them that we are able to get our city back and, 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 and we are indebted to them. Mm. But Alexander got, did not want to hear that, so he got so offensive that he decided that he was going to attack Jerusalem and destroy it. Mm -hmm. So he marched upon Jerusalem with the intent to destroy it. The high priest in Jerusalem uh, heard about it and went to, and prayed and told the people to pray. And he went to bed and had a dream. And in the dream, the priest was told that he should um, open the gates of Jerusalem that, and that all the priests should come out in their habitation that they wear and that he was supposed to wear the regalia of the high priest. Mm -hmm. And and uh and meet go meet Alexander. Well, Alexander the Great was so determined, his men were saying, "We're going to plunder Jerusalem. We're going to destroy it." Then, when he got to Jerusalem, they saw the priest standing outside, with all the other priests with him, and all the people lined up, and the people like greeting Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great stopped for a moment, and he looked and said, "I've seen that because he was adoring the priest's habit." Holiness to the Lord, the crown that he wore. And Alexander said, I seen this man in a dream. And in a dream, he told me, go up and conquer Medo-Persia. The man that Alexander saw in the dream was none other than Jesus himself. The Lord was directing Alexander's life and was trying to get Alexander to make a commitment to him like he did Nebuchadnezzar. But Alexander was taken to Jerusalem and the Jews showed Alexander the scrolls of Daniel and showed him where they were supposed. He was supposed to conquer the Persian Empire. And yeah, he would and be the and third. Then, and then he would be empire. the king, right? The third empire. And he took it upon himself that this was so. And Alexander the Great had offered offered sacrifice to God in Jerusalem and everything. And then from that point on, the Jews had a league with Alexander. But Alexander made this promise to them. He said, "Look here, your men can fight in our army, and at the same time, when he built the Alexandrian Library, he said he can have the education." Wow. And so through that educational system, that's how they was able to do it. And the education of Alexander came to the Jewish nation, Hellenism came into Jewish teachings to the point that they began to put aside the original teachings of the true education of the schools of the prophets. Wow. I, I ask again. And that's history repeats. And so the word of God was, was, was not taught. Instead, the oh, words of men. Hold it right there. We will be right back. Paul and Jesus both predict that the church of God becomes a force against God. The radical faith that Jesus taught had become the official religion of the empire that murdered him. The speed with which the early church tobogganed into apostasy will take your breath away. Welcome back. I'm sorry, Brother Patrick. Uh, you were reading or I was, mentioning a Bible verse? Yes, I was saying that uh, John the Baptist's education was from the Word of God directly, mm -hmm. and the Jewish schools were mingling the Word with uh, a lot of words of men mm -hmm. and their comments. And you can see that right in John chapter 1 where they're asking John the Baptist, Are you Elijah? No. 
Are you that prophet? No. Well, who are you so that we can give an answer to those that send us? And John, what did John say then? He quoted from the Bible because that's, that's how his life was being, was being guided and that's how our life can be guided by the Word of God. Amen. So he says, I am the voice, I, uh, in verse 23, he says, I am the voice of one that's crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And, and, and of course, we should clarify, we are not against a true education either. I mean, both, all of us have some type of degrees, both. college degrees. The, the problem comes is when we, when human beings try to put their education above the Word of God. Yeah. Is both, that okay? Both John the Baptist and Jesus were not educated in the schools of their day. Be, because, because of the corruption? Because like Pastor Barry had, they, had they gone to those schools, right. they would have been led away from their mission in life. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. They, 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 they would have been unfit for their work for God and to actually right. do the service they need to do. Mm -hmm. And that's true today. And God is also going to raise up men who are never who are not qualified by literary instruments of learning, but men who will be qualified by the unction of his spirit right. to go forth even in these last days. Even you know, Moses had to be re -educated. unlearn his right. Egyptian education. So are you telling me then that one of the reasons that God had to raise this Elijah. second Elijah spiritual Elijah, John the Baptist, hmm. was because those the message to prepare the people was not being given wow. in the synagogue, not only, and neither on the temple. Not only was not, but could not be given. Why not? Because they had been educated and <laughs> okay. that made them unable to we, do we it. We go to square one again, right? Yeah, yeah but okay. the, thing was, the thing we have is traditions of men are being exalted above the Word of God. And when that happens, you make void the Word of God through your traditions. Mm. And if you see, if you look at the life of Jesus carefully, when Jesus comes, mm. he's coming as Messiah. The Jews believe they have a misinterpretation of the prophecies. They believe that the Messiah is coming to take the kingdom and, and to take, break the Roman yoke. They don't see the Messiah as the Savior of the world, mm. as the one that's going to be sacrificed like in the animal system. In the animal ceremonial sacrificial system, that, show, that prefigured what the Messiah was to do first mm. as the Lamb of God. That's why John the Baptist would call him a lamb. Mm. Then later in the sanctuary service, the earth service, when, it's, when the Messiah is sacrificed and he begins his work in the heavenly sanctuary, mm. that prefigures what he'll be doing while interceding on, when, at the time when God's people will go through persecution, dark ages, and come down to the signs that will show that Christ is about to return. Amen. And so we have, through the sanctuary service, we, see a, we, we can see the life of Jesus, and we can see the purpose of his sacrifice in the outer court was to shed his blood for the salvation of the world, mm -hmm. and that to make the provision for men to be saved by his righteousness. Amen. But we also see that as his high, our high priest, he becomes our, he's our righteousness imputed and imparted, and he's helping us to develop the character because he must restore all things, including the image of God in man, first and foremost, along with one day restoring the planet mm. and redeeming all those who believed in him and took on his character. Amen. Um, very interesting. We find that the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, we can say then the, those messages is like the voice or the messages from the wilderness, mainly being given from the wilderness, away from all these big religious institutions, away from those big so-called religious leaders. Huh? Yeah. History repeats. Mm -hmm. Because to give those messages, you will have had to heed the second angel's message, which says to come out of those fallen church systems like John the Baptist and Jesus did. Wow. That's right. Amazing how God, okay, so going, keeping on the, on the same topic of Revelation 14, yeah, about so this 144,000. I just to bring up, your, your characteristic on Elijah first was that he was what? He was, uh, he was a Jehovah, student of the Word of God too. He was a student of the Word of God. His, his name at Jehovah was my God. He was a student of the Word of God. Uh, the characteristic of John the Baptist. Oh, he oh, also, he said, I need to decrease 
Jesus needs to be so increased. Showing that he's dying to self and sin on Amen. a daily basis. Amen. He's crucifying self. So and he, like, was, he was clothed like Elijah, too. That's right. He was clothed like Elijah, showing that he had a, he had a reformed dress. He wasn't dressing gaudy and flashy like some of the scribes and Pharisees were to his day. He, he, he kept his clothing plain and simple. And at the same time, some people like to ignore it. But John the Baptist was also, he had a straight, he had a straight diet as well. I was going to say that. Yeah. He was into the health reform. Right. Health well, reform. Some people will say, well, no, that's, see, yeah, that's an Adventist version of it. No, it's not an Adventist version of it because the Bible said that John the Baptist diet consisted of what? Carob and, and, and uh, I mean, what was it? Locust and honey. Wild mm. locusts and honey. But locust was a carob bean that he ate. He didn't eat grasshoppers. Okay? The locust tree. He ate from the locust tree. Right, right. And at the same time, he had a simple diet. All right. In these last days, God is also calling us to make our bodies his temple, Amen. that we would have a simple diet. And this is another area of health that needs to be understood, especially those who claim to be in the ministry. Right. And, and, and especially uh, so we can understand, be able to understand the message for this end time. You know, what happened nowadays, the medical signs are saying that the populations are uh, so much with the cholesterol, with so much, you know, disease, disease, but God wants us to have a healthy body so we can comprehend the truth, you know, for this end time and to be able to preach it to others too, right? Yes, Isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, so on the 144,000, I just wanted, uh, before we, we, we move on, uh, then they're going to be the third Elijah and also they're going to be facing this great conflict between the conflicts, between the union of church and state, and they will be also given an appointed message. And this is important. The message that one John the Baptist was giving and on the wilderness was a message of so, dis so distinctive that it bothered the king, it bothered the woman, the woman and the wife of the king. Likewise today, <laughs> you know, these messages, unfortunately, are going to go, you know, against those people that just want to be, you know, joining together with the governments and, and to uh, implement, you know, their teachings into their traditions. Yes. Well, this is one reason why it was quiet yeah, among yeah. the Jews. Uh, for 400 years, the Bible was silent because there was no prophet in Israel because of that educational system that they had. Wow. John, yes. silence the voice of the word of God. John the Baptist's message was to repent, repent of their sins. Sin is when we break one of God's Ten Commandments. And so John the Baptist was trying to prepare a people for Christ's first coming by preaching the gospel to give them victory over sin and a clean heart and clean mind so that they could receive Christ. And that is the same message to prepare people for Christ's Second coming. Amen. Amen. Victory over sin, individual and corporate sin. Amen. Amen. On verse 3, the, the Bible of Revelation 14, it says that they, this group of people, they said they sang as it were a new song before the throne huh? and before the four beasts, etc., etc. Now, we remember in the Old Testament, also in the book of Deuteronomy, it is speak about uh, this new song also that Moses uh, and his people were to be, you know, they had to sing. And I, I see a similarity because Moses was dealing also with a very, um, in the very, it was in the very time when he took, he was called to, to bring the people out, out of Egypt, okay, introduce them into the promised land, wow. into the promised land. Which was a symbol of heaven. A symbol of heaven. Yeah. Likewise today, this last generation that will represent Jesus in this earth, mm. that will be translated, that will enter, that will enter in the promised land. This, the Bible said that they will sing a song also. Be the, the land. This, this, I'm, I mean, right. so many similarities in the Bible. Because they're being called out of bondage of Egypt, sin, yeah. And being brought by Jesus to the promised land. And out of the bondage of the Pharaoh, there was a, you know, the, a king in Egypt, the Pharaoh, also in this end time, Let's, yeah. the, the, this group of people are going to be just obeying Christ 
and crush along. Let, let's just be realistic about one thing. The question, the, the reason why they're singing a new song is because number one, they have they have victory over sin. Amen. They have gotten they have gotten the victory. Now, the question, they have been overcomers. All right. A lot of people think that they're going to be saved in God's kingdom without overcoming. Well, you, that's why you, they're the calling from. That's why in I'm sorry, mm -hmm. chapter seven says they are they're like a. From Israel, right? And over here too, they're talking means, about this name. Israel means overcomer. Overcome, okay. But now I want to bring something to this: that the Bible shows that they're they're justified, they experience justification, sanctification. But going on, it says here, whosoever is First John three nine says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for he his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In other words, those who are born of God who have the new covenant will be seeking obedience to God's commandments, and they will be seeking to put away sin. They will not continue on in willful and presumptuous transgression of God's law. Mm. They will not practice secret iniquity. The Bible said, goes on and tells us this, though. What does it mean to be born of God? 1 John 5, 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcome of the world. Mm. And this is the victory to overcome of the world, even our faith. So who is he that overcome of the world? But he that believeth in Jesus is the Son of God. Mm. So we're going to find that the 144,000 and all who will be in heaven, will be people who have gotten victory over sin through the power of Christ's love and righteousness. Amen. It goes on and says here, the overcomer is a believer, as a belief, overcoming is the belief of the genuine Christian. Hold on. What type of Christian? The a genuine. genuine Christian, not a professed Christian. Mm -hmm. Not one with a form of godliness, but a genuine Christian. Mm -hmm. It says they're going to, they got promise of the overcomers are as such. Mm -hmm. I just want to, uh, all this is good. Unfortunately, our time is our, is our worst enemy over here. We, we need to conclude the program for today. Obviously, we're going to continue bringing to you all this characteristic of the 144,000 because we want you, as long with, with us, to be part of that special group that God will have at this end time. In the meantime, God bless you all. Our Voice of the Eternal Gospel family thanks you for joining us. Generous contributors like you keep us broadcasting. Prayerfully consider supporting this ministry. Donations are tax deductible and can be sent to Voice of the Eternal Gospel, P.O. Box 15138, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33416. Our phone number is 1-866-7th-DAY-2. That's 1-866-784-3292. And our web address is voiceoftheeternalgospel.com. Find out what the critics are raving about. Top scholars and theologians from around the country come together to reveal the hidden history of the book of Revelation. With powerful reenactments and incredible visual effects, this 95-minute masterpiece brings to life the book of Revelation like never before. Revelation is no longer a mystery. Get your copy today.